Welcome everybody to the presentation on the minimum edit arborescence problem and its use in compressing graph collections. This was a joint work with Nicolas Boria and Florian Eger from Lamsat Laboratory at Université Paris-Dauphine, Sébastien Bougleu from Université de Caen, and David Blumenthal from the Department of Artificial Intelligence in Biomedical Engineering at Frederick Alexander University. Let me introduce the plan of the presentation. First, we will talk about the general, general setting of the problem. On the next section, we will define the minimum edit arborescence problem and provide a general algorithm to solve it. We will then introduce the more specific minimum graph edit arborescence problem, which is the MEA applied to spaces of graphs. And all this will allow us to present our practical implementation for compressing graph collections. The last section will detail our implementation and the results we obtain. Let's start with the preliminaries. We will call an edit space any space omega of objects or data structures with an equivalence relation and a set of edit operations that allow the transformation of any object into one another. Each operation will be associated with a cost so that we may induce a notion of distance within objects by considering minimum cost paths between them. Some examples of such spaces are the space of strings of length n with character substitution. Uh, we can go further and, and take sets of strings of any length with character insertion, deletion, and substitution. And of course, we're interested in graphs with vertex edge insertion, deletion, and relabeling, uh, which uh, will get us to the GED, the graph edit distance. Now we are ready to formulate the minimum edit arborescence problem. Generally speaking, the MEA looks uh, for a minimum cost arborescence on the, on the space omega we're interested in, rooted at the empty element. The arrows or edges between elements of the space represent the edit paths that transform the source element into a target one. And ideally, if one were able to compute the optimal edit paths between every pair of elements, the problem reduces to just a traditional minimum uh, spanning arborescence problem, which can be done in polynomial time. And this gives us the first algorithm. So we consider a complete graph with nodes in our collection plus the empty element, and we weight every edge with the, the distance we, 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 can, we, we assume we can compute. And then over that complete graph, we solve the minimum spanning arborescence problem rooted at the empty element. It looks simple, but there's a major problem in practice. Uh, and it's that in general, finding the optimal edit paths between objects is an MP hard problem. This is true particularly for graphs. Uh, and moreover, this edit path computation must be must be called n square times. So this constitutes an important bottleneck. For those cases uh, where the bottleneck is, is important, we present a modification of the first algorithm. This has some changes. So the first modification tries to control the density of the graph, reducing the number of edit paths to compute. We do this by sampling a percentage of neighbors for every element of the collection instead of, of having the complete graph. The second modification adds prior knowledge to improve results and, and maybe reduce the number of necessary edges to consider. Consider, for example, a collection of elements issued from an evolving structure like a time series. So then you would expect you would expect the temporal edges to to be promising. So you can insert them if you know that that those are the temporal edges connecting uh, evolving uh, structures. The last modification differentiates two different edit path algorithms. So assume you have a fast and not so sharp one, and then you have a a very sharp algorithm that takes a lot of time. So we propose that you use the fast and, and not so sharp algorithm to create the first approximations, then compute the minimum spanning arborescence, and then use the sharper one only on the on the edges selected by the arborescence. That way you reduce the, the from n squared to n the number of, of times you have to call the, the slow and sharp algorithm. Now that we have formulated the problem and presented our heuristic, we can give further definitions to, to treat our case of interest. So for for the minimum graph edit arborescence problem, we will set omega to be a space of label graphs. And 
the edit operations we will consider are just the, the traditional operations associated with the graph edit distance, which are vertex and edge insertion, deletion, and relabeling. The GED itself has been widely studied, and there are many different sets of uh, operations and rules on how to apply these this, uh, ele elementary operations. And there's also a lot of, of, of theory around the costs, and this allows for different reform reformulations of the GED problem to try to make it easier or, or yeah, easier to, to compute. So we choose the approach given in Buglio et al, based on the notion of node map or error correcting by party matching. A node map is a correspondence uh, between nodes, considering a dummy element for insertions and deletions. And it was shown that, that under some mild assumptions on the edit operations and costs, the GED problem is equivalent to finding the optimal error correcting matching. Moreover, and something that is very important for us, um, the node maps provide an inducer path. So if you have the node map and the graphs you are matching, you can you can create an edit path. Uh, as a little word on node maps, they work on a on a subset of edit paths. Um, if your cost function respects the triangle inequality. Um, you, this restricted set of edit paths will still contain an optimal an optimal solution. So that's why if you find the optimal node map, you you, you find the optimal edit path. And one important thing is that they they order the, the operations because of the restrictions they make on the edit paths. So that deletions are made first, then substitutions, then insertions. It makes a lot of sense, and it will be useful for our implementation. Um, particularly because we, we will use something that we call default node maps. I will talk about that later. So yeah, it will be kind of crucial for our, for our implementation. Let me now um, introduce you to our practical implementation of the MGEA framework for the particular task of graph, graph compression, compressing graph collections. So we have to define all the components, right? So as said before, we are interested in collections of graphs, for example, molecules. Then the edit operations are the usual ones, so vertex and edge deletion, insertion and, and relabeling, plus something we will call implied edge deletions. I will talk about that later more in detail. And in terms of costs, uh, we aimed at creating some edit costs that represented our real objective function. So we want to compress graphs, um, and therefore we want to minimize the number of bytes used to encode every graph. So we formulated some edit costs that will make the cost of an edit path um, equal or related to the number of bytes needed to encode it in a file using an, encoded, an encoding that we defined. Let's give a look at the following diagram. So this arborescence, this very particular arborescence, corresponds to, to the traditional one file per graph encoding. So you have a collection of, of graphs and you just consider uh, a, a star, that's why we call it star solution, from the empty element to every graph. Um, it comes down to saving everything in, in a separate file because to save something from the, from the empty graph, you, you just have to list all the insertions, right? So you get all the nodes, you, you have to save all the nodes, all the edges and all the labels. So this star solution will give us like a reference point, a reference of a baseline of uh, on how the method uh, can perform. This second diagram shows what we would like to achieve. So instead of saving everything independently by listing everything, we would like to save up space using reference-based compression, leveraging on the similarities between the graphs. So the first graphs will be saved entirely and they represent the, the roots of the subtrees in the hierarchy of our collection. From there on, all the other graphs are saved as edit paths from a source graph. So we just save the modifications needed to transform the, the source graph into the, to the target one. Let's have a small word on implied edge deletions, uh, why we, we, we use them or we differentiate them, it's because the usual uh, node deletion uh, 
it needs that all the edges are removed before. So in terms of space, of space, this is not optimal because because you have to list all the edges and then delete the node. And we would like to 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 save us to save up space so that if you delete a node and it has edges, you just deduce that all the edges have to be deleted. Uh, this small change requires careful reformulation of the costs and of the uh, of the algorithms, but it was made and it was it was fine. Now on the deep costs, let's have a small word on that. First, we calculate the number of bytes needed to encode a node index and a node label. This can be made before compressing um, and just after reading the collection. So you read the collection and you you compute the number of uh, the maximum number of nodes, uh, the number of, of attributes, the what are they, their types and everything. And if you have these quantities then you can define these costs. So inserting a node requires only an, a node label. Deleting a node, you just have to, to tell the, the index of the node you want to delete. And substitutions require both. There are some small details here. For example, it is true that identical substitutions are free, but you still need a way to know or deduce the node matching, right? Because even if, if you're sending a node to a new node that has the same label, uh, you might change the, the 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 index of the node, so that is why implicitly here we are using something that we call the fault node maps because we don't want to save the whole node map because that would take a lot of space. So we we use the fault node maps and we leverage on the on the ordering uh, that we talked about deletion, substitutions, insertions, and that way we can we can not save the uh, we can avoid saving the, the node map. On the edges, well, very similar. You just compute the, the number of bytes needed to encode an edge attribute, and then you have these costs. They also heavily depend on the default node, node maps we will talk about. So, these default node maps and, and the fact that you don't save the original ones uh, gives, uh, gives us this situation. So, as we do not encode the original ones, the decompressed versions of the graphs are isomorphic but not equal. And that's why the next challenge is to deal with, with, with this problem. So what happens if, you, if you're not careful? You end up with an isomorphic copy. You want to delete a node you know, that, is, that is indexed using the, the, the source graph. And then you will delete the node you, you, you thought was right, but you end up deleting another node because the, the indices were permuted. Or for example, you want to insert an edge, and you have the source and the target nodes of, uh, of, the, of the edge, but as the nodes per were permuted, uh, you end up adding the edge where, where you're not supposed to do it. So how to take care of this? First, we have to understand what a default node map is. So just as a general definition, uh, the, the, a default node map, so given, given G1 and G2, the original graphs and the original node map between them, we can create the, or think about the default node map uh, such that you have two isomorphic copies of G1 and G2 called G1 prime and G2 prime, such that the default node map will make the same thing, the same transformation on the that the original node map made, but between these isomorphic copies. So G1 prime is isomorphic to G1, and the the default node map will end up in a in a isomorphic version of G2. Now, with this set, the compression process will look similar to this diagram. First, we have the original succession of edit paths that we found at the compression step. And if we had all these node maps, we could just follow this path while decompressing, right? Nevertheless, as we use default node maps to save a memory space, uh, the decompression path might be something similar to this. So you start with, with not isomorphic, but really equal graphs, but at some point you might get a permutation of the nodes. And then we risk of inserting edges on the wrong nodes and, and of wrongly applying the edit operations. So our goal is to find these node isomorphisms, these, these node correspondences, uh, such that we, we really know where to put everything, right? Um, 
Luckily, we don't have to solve the gravity morphism problem because we can deduce the bijections between between the original node, uh, nodes and the and the decompressed versions. Um, and if you can do this, then you can really get everything working. Now that we explained the method, let's give a look at the experiment. We used eight graph collections, five of them related to molecules and other three related to stock market correlation trees. We used um, Gedlib, which is a very nice C++ library uh, with a lot of GED heuristics. And we compared our method against a traditional um, very well-known compression method, which, which is tar uh, Our baseline or our reference point was compressing the original graph collection, which, which were stored in GXL format. And as the main results, we can list that the, the method itself works very well for five datasets. And we discovered that adding an, an additional layer of tar uh, gives you better results. Uh, Another thing is that if you have prior knowledge, then the method can be really, really fast and work really, really well. So if you have promising edges that really connect similar structures, then the method can work really, really well. Uh, here are the, um, the graphs that we plotted. So the orange line shows the compression ratio of the method without the extra layer of tar -Bizet. As you can see, it is better for for most cases than the gray line, which is the tar alone. And moreover, if you add the extra layer of tar which is the green line, you always get better results than the, than the gray line. As you can see, you get, of course, lower compression ratios as you add more edges so that your, your solution, you have more options to, to, to compute a minimum spanning arborescence. Um, but this density parameter will of course affect the time and compression time is considerable. It grows linearly with the parameter of, of graph density um, and it can really take a lot of time. But the good thing is that the compression uh, time is much lower and it will fit situations where, where you have to compress the collection once and then just decompress it multiple times. For example, if you offer a collection uh, to download. Here are the graphs on, uh, of, of the times for the, for the compression process. Uh, I would like you to focus on the yellow line first, which is the, the, first, the first part of the method, which is just the ABC compression. Uh, you get a linear, a linear time with respect to the graph density. And then the pink line shows the refinement process where you, add, where you use the, the second sharper and slower heuristic to get better uh, edit paths, better node, map, better node maps. Uh, you can see that this is constant over, over the density parameter and it has a, a higher variance, in particular because of the method we use that depends on random starts. Um, so you can really play with, with, with those heuristics. You can use sharper ones if you have time, you, you can use faster ones if you don't have time. And it's, it's good to know that it's linear with respect to to the to density parameter, and then it's just constant with the, with, uh, for the refinement phase. Thank you very much, and I would be happy to to ask uh, to answer the questions you have.